So I'm Hiko Simon and this is Rochelle Kopp. And we are back for another episode of How Not to Screw Up in Japan, uh, Business Edition. I think this is the final topic which uh, we suddenly got inspired to last week. Uh, it, it's a week now, we've come back, we're wearing the same clothes and I've got the same stubble. It's, it's a very <laughs> technical process. Is that we are now, um, in terms of what we always get to, what I'm always focused on, I find it fascinating in Japan, I'm always in Japan obviously, but looking at the multinational companies that come and they fail mm-hmm. in Japan, they, mm-hmm. sometimes they end up divorcing and breaking up, and the companies that succeed. And, right. and you know, it's funny, it's not a very big distinction between the companies that fail and succeed. Sometimes it can be just down to a couple of people. Right. But you know, it's always fascinating to me to look at. I'm in a company now that's relatively successful, I think, at hybridizing, although, I, you know, again, I never take it for granted. But I'm always trying to figure out myself, what's the secret sauce? What's the, uh-huh. What are the elements that make for a successful Japan foreign multicultural company right. or hybridized right. culture, I think mm-hmm. we mentioned before? Right. So what, this, this holy grail of a successful Japanese company in America or a successful German company in Japan, or right. what are the elements that really make a... a, a Good to use a consulting term, a synergistic, a, right, good, right, uh, right. a good hybridized culture. Well, well, how do you get to that? Well, you have to have a really good balance between having a global approach as your multinational yes. and knowing as a company of what your strengths are and what are the key things that you really want to have reflected in every market that you operate in. Yeah. And I have a real sense of what that is. Yeah. And at the same time, you have to figure out what are the things that we need to change to be effective in this environment. Right. And so there's some things that you want to always stick with and there's some things that you want to localize yeah. and, and balancing those two. But think, and it was, again, sounds really simple, but I think just even consciously thinking about that, mm. there are some multinationals that consciously think about it and some that don't, are just kind of really mushy in their ideas. Yeah. So that's a really big one. And I think the other key one is to have really excellent local talent. Yes. Yeah. And again, that, it sounds very obvious, but you have to have a system that br- you, is attractive to the local talent and brings them in and keeps them. But you know, it's, it's such a fine line have good local talent but have good local talent that still listens to you in a way as well mm-hmm. i mean again I'm, I'm talking i know you're more familiar or you deal more day-to-day probably with the american you know, where this happens in america i'm more day-to-day looking at it in japan there are so many big name multinationals in japan which are almost like franchise outlets here you know they're completely on their own you know off the radar right w- with the occasional expat in the corner office and they're using the right, trademark right. and everything but they're for intents but and they're purposes per- completely companies. localized and they're not yeah they're not integrated uh, but at the same time they're not divorced per se they are, they're still acting as that right, right. large it and company's brand name and right, right right and that large it company is like oh we'll just leave them alone right yeah. and sometimes just leave them alone and they're doing great and sometimes they're just not really doing much right yeah and then there's and that in itself, they can be too local and they can drift away. Right. Or they go independent or all of a sudden you find out one day that they've split off from you. Um, or you can be too global and mm-hmm. you get a rebellion. And I've right, seen right, right. rebellions happen in Japan yeah. as well. Yeah, and that could be not pretty. Yeah, and actually, you know what? For rebellions that I've seen, probably, certainly every time, and this is relevant for your book which you're releasing, mm-hmm. The disparity in treatment of expats uh, HR packages in Japan mm-hmm. uh-huh. is probably always in the top three open and upfront elements of discontent that leads to a corporate divorce. Right, yeah. Um, you know, these guys, they can't do anything and they're getting paid and five times more than me. And, and they're living in a lovely place in Rapungi. And yeah, exactly. Every, and, yeah. and, you know, and I, it's a I don't work for you. Yeah. Yeah, was, uh, I mean, that is it. There's the yeah. Also, a fascinating example with Olympus. Um, when that Olympus scandal came out and all the you know, embezzlement and stuff like that, um, when all the weeklies picked up that news story, the first thing that they focused on when they decided to demonize the embezzling old boss was uh-huh. not the embezzlement. It was the fact that it came out through the disclosures of the whistleblower that the, that the CEO was receiving $1 million per year in pay. Mm. Which, you know, by American standards, $1 million a for a CEO is not, not a big, big deal, deal at all. But here it's a big deal. But that was what everybody, and actually all the two chan comments, all of the, you know, uh-huh. all of the, let's round up and kill this guy, one million dollars, you know, which is 
kind of it's crazy. Kind of funny, actually. But that, yeah. but that was how they demonized him, and that right. it, it oh. wasn't actually something that technically he did wrong. Right, right, right. But it was it was such a looked so bad in the Japanese. It context. made him look like the evil villain, you know, immediately when as soon as they put that on him. Wow. So HR, I didn't you know, know that. and I don't, and in a way, so I don't know exactly how you solve that. Certainly, one thing, there's no question, you have to keep that information as secret as you can possibly keep it secret. Exactly. Uh, it doesn't sound like the right way of doing it. Most people say, let's talk about it and share it or justify it. No, don't justify it. Don't talk no, no, about no, it. Don't even don't try. It. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. And I've even seen situations where, you know, the expats will have a party and they'll invite all the Japanese staff who then, like, come see the giant place they're living oh. in in Abu Juban and, like, oh, this is ten times larger than my entire building that I live in in the oh, little yes. corner, right? And never yeah. talk up. I mean, never, yeah, again, tip for expats. Don't talk up the, the, the nice package that you're getting. Or any, or any nice thing, that, a luxurious thing that you're doing, right? It's just going to aggravate people. Yeah. It's kind of false modesty in a way. But seriously, false modesty goes a long way in Japan. Yeah, it's part of the culture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I don't know. So there's definitely the HR thing is definitely a, an area to be very sensitive around. Actually, right, exactly. Um, but I don't know. What, what, what are the other elements that you think of hybridized in terms of reporting lines, for right, example? Right, exactly. I, I, I find a lot of Japanese have trouble with the matrix kind of approach that so many American multinationals take. That's, right. Yeah, that tends to be very, very confusing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, for the best I can judge, and I've seen different examples of how it's done. I, I, there's two things I've noticed. One, we have a lot of these merged joint companies in Japan. When, when, mm -hmm. a, when, a, when an American company gets a very big and successful Japanese company and they partner, I've seen multiple cases where they've ended up breaking up, where there was a misunderstanding from the outset. The Americans mm. thought they were acquiring a local subsidiary, and the Japanese thought they were getting a global trademark name to attach to their local business. Interesting. And so, and, and it all goes well until the first disagreement of opinion, and they believe that at least they're set up as an equal power relationship. And, you know, in the end of the day, the Japanese side will just shut down the American side altogether and shut them yeah, out. Right. But if you don't, one thing I've found is that if there is not a clear, you, you get along, but if there's not a clear way to break those deadlocks where one side clearly has more power than the other, mm -hmm. be it the foreign side or the Japanese side, um, there has to be a thing, it has to be understood and respected by the other side that this is the, and this is where I've been in a, a, a relatively successful international firm, I'll say that, which basically built up its Japanese part of the, you know, its, its local Japanese firm. The Americans hired and helped to support and set up the Japanese firm. Mm -hmm. And so that always meant that whenever you got these cultural differences or approach to the same thing and there was a need for a referee to come in, uh -huh. the Japanese who were the most senior Japanese by that point were people who came up in the, in the American company and would kind of favor one side. But you've got to favor one side mm -hmm. because you have other firms that in Japan that broke apart where, you know, at the top they disagreed all the way to the top and, and those things just built up and they exploded. Right, right. So you need that kind of way to deal to, to break deals. And I think you do need it, like you said, you need a kind of a consistent global net mm. culture, which everyone at least understands. And people who are in the responsibility positions understand and follow. Right. They have to respect that. You can be local with your clients and everything locally. Right, you can right, do your right. business locally, but your reporting, you know, processes, if I, all, all that sort of stuff, you have, to, you have to still have that overarching net. It is right. the global and local balance. Exactly, exactly. But yeah, yeah. So there, there are certain ways of doing things that your company is going to want to have be consistent globally. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, even that, it's always fine-tuning. There's always the, let's be more global, or oh, we have to be more local. And, and, yes, you get a little bit out of sync, and it can, it can really, it's, it never take it for granted. Right. Never take right, it right, for right. granted. It's just because one of those always you have to balance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is a fascinating series. Um, and... Can't wait to get you back on again. So we always have fantastic chats. I've met yes. Rochelle, I think, mm -hmm. uh, two or three times now in Japan on your visits over here. Mm -hmm. um, I love following your forum on LinkedIn and so yeah. on, on the, mm -hmm. the conversations on that. That's how we got connected. Uh, we have great chats. So I always thought it's the same as with Victor. I just mm -hmm. thought, well, why don't we just record one of these chats? Because I think this will make awesome video material. And I think this has been a really cool series. It's been really fun. Thank you so much. So thank you. Yes. Um, and book coming out. Yes, yes. Creating Engaged Employees in Japan. Yes, I know some people who need that book, so uh, I'll get that, and uh, I'll put links. When is the book coming oh, out? Oh, um, within the next couple months. Okay, yeah. so pretty soon. Pretty soon. Pretty soon. Uh, I'll certainly be sharing the information on that uh, when, when that's around. And um, yes, I hope you enjoyed that. And if you liked it, maybe we'll do another series next yeah. time you're in Japan. That would be great. Cool. Okay, thank you okay. for watching. Thanks. Bye bye.